After Chinggis Khan forced the Tangut into submission, his attention turned to the Qin Dynasty, the most powerful state in Asia. This juggernaut had dominated North China since the early 1100s, but had weakened from extreme corruption and violent floods from the Yellow River that destroyed valuable farmland, displacing thousands. What's more, the Qin rulers were Jurchen, originally from Manchuria. The peasantry were mainly Han Chinese with a significant number of Khitans in the Qin armies, who were constantly on the edge of rebelling, and both groups were marginalized by the Jurchen. Antagonizing both of these populations undermined Qin power, which Chinggis took full advantage of. From 1206 to 1208, the Qin had been distracted by war with the Sung dynasty, and in 1208 had a new emperor, the Prince of Wei, a spiteful and incompetent man, giving Chinggis a chance to consolidate his new empire. Since the 1190s, the Qin had considered the Mongols their vassals, the Prince of Wei having attempted to assert Qin authority over Chinggis in early 1208, only for the Khan to laugh him off. When Qin envoys came again in 1210 telling Chinggis to recognize the Prince of Wei as the new emperor, he insulted him once more, an unforgivable transgression. Chinggis rested his forces for the rest of 1210, and in March 1211 held a Kurultai to officially declare war justifying it on the death of his relative on Bahai. In May, the Mongols crossed the Gobi Desert, splitting their force into two armies, an east and a west wing. The west wing was led by his sons Juchi, Jaghatai, and Urgadai, while the larger east wing was split into two groups, one led by Jib, Tsubutai, and Chinggis's brother Khazar, while Chinggis, Muhali, and Tolui led the other. After crossing the Gobi in parallel, the Mongols took the submission of the Yonggud tribe in June, adding 10,000 to the perhaps 70 to 100,000 strong Mongol army. Qin forces were already spread thin, guarding their borders with the Mongols, Tangut, and Song, and Chinggis spread them even further by sending the West Wing into the Ordos Desert, intending to keep the Qin from concentrating their forces. By midsummer, Qin settlements were already submitting to Chinggis. The Prince of Wei sent a peace offer to Chinggis, which the Great Khan rejected. Now was not the time for peace. In August, the Jurchen general Chitrung was sent to strengthen the front with a hundred thousand men. The Qin Empire was suffering from a severe famine on top of everything else, so it was imperative that they deal with the Mongols before they could ravage the remaining farmland in Hebei and Shanxi provinces. North China is separated from the steppe by mountain ranges, through which the Great Wall of China would eventually run. At that time, there was no continuous Great Wall, but a series of smaller walls and fortified passes, the most significant at Yehuling, the Wild Fox Ridge. In late August, the Mongols came to the pass, filled with Qin troops. Che Chung was cautious and would not be let out into the open. To stall for time, Che Chung sent a Khitan officer, Ming An, who had met Chinggis before, to start negotiating. Ming An promptly defected and told Chinggis everything he knew about the Qin positions, the nature of the pass, and the structure of the Qin army. Chinggis now had his plan. While outnumbered and unable to outmaneuver the Qin, most of the Qin force was unprofessional infantry, Han Chinese with no love for the Qin. Entering a section of the pass known as Hunye Tzu, known better in English as Badger's Mouth Pass, the Mongols launched devastating volleys of arrows into the Chinese infantry, weakening their morale and men. A cavalry charge by Mukhali sent the Jurchen cavalry reeling into the infantry, trampling them, and Che Chung's force broke. In medieval battles, the greatest number of casualties occurred during routs when the enemy fell upon a fleeing foe. And so it was at Yehuling, the bones of the fallen 
were said to still be piled high ten years later. Che Chung rallied his troops at He He Bao Fortress, 48 kilometers from the pass, hoping the Mongol forces would fall away to loot and plunder the abandoned Qin camp, or be too wary to fight. But Chinggis had long since disciplined his forces to avoid plundering until the enemy was defeated, and with spare mounts, the Mongols once again crushed the Qin. Che Chung fled with survivors, meeting church and horsemen on the Songhong River, where the next day they fought valiantly for several hours before their resolve finally broke. Che Chung fled again, leaving the dynasty to its fate. Chinggis' army was now in Hebei province, and all that stood between them and the capital of Chengdu was the fortified pass of Chu Yongkuan. Chinggis' great General Jeeb led a force into the pass, saw how strong it was, and promptly retreated. The defenders saw the Mongols run, and rushed out to chase them, and fell right into Jeeb's trap. Jeeb took the pass, and by late October, Chinggis' army was able to raid the suburbs of Chengdu. But for now, Chengdu could not be touched. The cities and fortresses the Mongols had taken had been through tricks or submission, and their siege craft had not yet improved enough to take mighty Chengdu through force. Still, the Mongols ran amok through Hebei province. In late November 1211, Yelu Ahai, a Khitan in service of the Mongols, stole the horses from the imperial pastures, depriving the Jurchen and Hebei of several thousand horses and greatly weakening their cavalry, and provided an excellent gift for Chinggis Khan. By January 1212, Chinggis sent Jeep to take the old Qin capital of Tunqing, the defenders falling for a feigned retreat. The loss of Tunqing was a massive psychological blow to the Prince of Wei, and sparked off a revolt among the Khitans, which would cut off Manchuria and the Jurchen homeland from Jin control. At the same time, the army under Chinggis' sons kept up pressure on the Qin in Shanxi province, developing their siege techniques. Chinggis himself returned to Mongolia with their loot, taking some time to rest before resuming their campaign. At this stage, long-term conquest was not their goal, but rather hoping to force the Qin into a tributary relationship as with the Tangut. The Mongols still lacked the ability to take major cities through force, which prevented true conquest. Chinggis did not even leave troops to occupy the border passes once they left, and the Qin were quick to retake them, re-fortifying Chu Yongren. Yet Chinggis had learned much and was eager to apply his knowledge when he returned to China in autumn 1212, the stage of the campaign we will investigate in the next video.